And I'm happy to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Richard Stallman, as we know, he's well known among all of us, having, having long history from, from free software movement start in the beginning of the 80s and a lot of achievements and rewards. I think we have time to list all of those, and maybe it's not needed. Nice. Maybe the content and substance will be speak on behalf of that. So, so now we have a bit longer slot. We have all been one and a half hour. So, so take a good position, relax, and listen to the content. I think it's a Please. First, I have two requests. If you take a photo of me, do not put it on Facebook. <laughs> Facebook is a surveillance engine. Its purpose is to collect and abuse personal data. If you put the photo of someone on Facebook, you give that person one more, you give Facebook one more opportunity to do surveillance on that person. We could dispute whether putting photos of your friends in Facebook is proper treatment for a friend. But that doesn't affect me. However, putting photos of me in Facebook does affect me. I don't want Facebook to have to know anything about me. It has no right to. So, please don't put photos of me in Facebook. Second, if you make a recording of this talk and you want to distribute copies, please do so only in the formats that are favorable to free software. That means the AUG formats and WebM. Not in MP whatever. Not, oh, certainly not with Flash. And not in Real Player, Windows Media Player, or QuickTime. <clears throat> And please put on the license Creative Commons No Derivatives because this speech states my personal opinions. <clears throat> so, what is free software? Free software is software that respects the user's freedom and community. So, in Finnish, it's Baba Ogyanisto. <clears throat> I don't really care whether a program is available gratis or not. That's just a detail of no great moral significance. <clears throat> On the other hand, whether it respects our freedom, that's tremendously important. If a program is not free, we call it proprietary software, non-free software, user subjugating software because a non-free program generates a system of unjust power, power for the developer or owner over the users. And it keeps the users divided and helpless. Divided because they're forbidden to redistribute it and helpless because they don't have the source code so they can't change it or even study it to determine what it does. So, <clears throat> it's justice requires that all software be free. But what I've said so far is very general. It respects freedom and community. What does that really mean in concrete terms? 
there are four essential freedoms that define free software. A program is free if, if you, the user, get these four freedoms over the use of the software. Freedom zero is the freedom to run the program as you wish, for whatever purpose you choose. Freedom one is the freedom to study the source code and change it so the program does your computing the way you wish. Freedom two is the freedom to help others to make and distribute exact copies of the program when you wish. And freedom three is the freedom to contribute to your community, to make and distribute copies of your modified versions when you wish. So, if the program comes with these four freedoms, then it's free software because the social system of its distribution and use is an ethical one one that respects the user's freedom and community. But if one of these four freedoms is missing or insufficient, then the program is proprietary because it imposes an unethical social system on its users. In order for these freedoms to be adequate, they must apply to all areas, to all activities of life including business, because business is a, a part of life, uh, and as long as we continue to have business as a part of life, people shouldn't be subjugated by other, by software developers in their business activities any more than in the rest of their activities. However, none of these four freedoms is mandatory. They're not obligatory. So with freedom zero, you're free to run the program as you wish, but it's not required. If you're a masochist, you can run it as you don't wish. And you also have the option of not running it. With freedom one, you can study and change the source code, but it's not required. You can also receive the program and run it without looking at anything. In fact, that's the usual case. Even a programmer is too busy to study most of the programs that she uses. <clears throat> With Freedom 1, you can redistribute exact copies of the program when you wish, but it's not required, it's not compulsory. We never say, you must distribute a copy to him. But the point is, you should be free to do so if you choose to do so. With Freedom 3, if you have made a modified version, you can distribute copies of that when you wish. It's not required. You can use your modified version privately. In that case, we call it private software. Private software means you have it and you use it and you don't distribute it. There's nothing wrong with that. We don't say that you must distribute your private version. But uh, if you wish to use it privately, you may. Note the difference between private software and proprietary software. Private software, you have a copy and you choose not to distribute it. Proprietary software comes to you from someone else in a way that restricts you. So, you can see that the distinction between free and proprietary software is not a technical distinction. It's not a question of what features the program has. It's not a question of how they're implemented. It's not a question of how the code was written. Those are all technical questions, which means less important. This is an ethical, social, and political distinction, which is why it's so important for everyone that uses software. The use in society of a free program is development because every program embodies knowledge and when it's free, that knowledge is available to the users for them to learn. Then they can maintain, adapt, and extend the program. They can also use their knowledge in other ways. However, the use of a proprietary program in society is not development because it's dependence. Imposed dependence on one particular entity. And that is 
harm to society. It's a social problem. So if we see people using a proprietary program, we should try to put an end to that. It's a bad thing that they are using a proprietary program, a bad thing that they have let someone else have that kind of power over them. <clears throat> Of course, there's generally a reason for that. They generally, in exchange for letting someone have power over them, they probably got something that they wanted in the short term. Or whoever has the power has made it so inconvenient to escape that most people don't try. That is no excuse. That's the reason why the situation exists. That doesn't justify it. It's still wrong. To develop a free program is a contribution to society. How much? That depends on the details. Uh, if it does a lot of useful things very well, that's a big contribution. If it does very little and does that badly, it's a small contribution. But if it's free software, it's distributed in such a way that it can contribute whatever it has to offer. But developing a proprietary program is no contribution because it's a power grab. It's an attempt to subjugate others. And that's wrong. In social terms, that proprietary program is a trap. If it has attractive features, those are the bait for the trap. Their purpose is to attract users to surrender their freedom becoming users of that program. So, paradoxically, attractive features don't make a proprietary program better. They make it more harmful. So if you have the choice to develop a proprietary program or do nothing at all, ethically speaking, you should do nothing at all because that way you don't do harm. Developing a proprietary program is doing harm to society. So, in real life, you'd probably have other choices that are better than both of those. And fine, take them. But if it's really just those two choices, don't write the proprietary program. So, the goal of the free software movement is for all software to be free, so that all the users of software can be free. However, why are these four freedoms essential? Why define free software this way? Each of the freedoms has a reason. Freedom to, the freedom to help others, the freedom to redistribute exact copies when you wish, is essential on fundamental moral grounds, so you can live an upright ethical life as a good member of your community. If you use a program without freedom to, you are in danger falling into a moral dilemma at any moment, whenever your good friend says, could I have a copy? At that moment, you will face a choice between two evils. One evil is to give your good friend a copy and violate the license of the program. The other evil is to refuse your good friend a copy and comply with the license <coughs> of the program. If you are in this dilemma, you ought to choose the lesser evil which is to give your good friend a copy and violate the license of the program. <laughs> Why is this the lesser evil? Because when you can't avoid doing wrong to somebody or other, it's less bad to do the wrong to somebody who deserves it because he's acted wrong. We can assume that your good friend is a good member of your community and normally deserves your cooperation. That's the usual case. There are occasional exceptions, but usually that's, this is how it is. But the developer of the proprietary program will have acted, will have deliberately attacked the social solidarity of your community, which is very bad. So if you have to do wrong to one or the other, do it to the developer. However, being 
the lesser evil does not mean it's good. Uh, it's never good to make an agreement and then break it. Not even when the agreement itself is evil, like this one. Uh, in cases like this, where the agreement is evil, keeping it is worse than breaking it, but breaking it is still not good. So, and if you give your good friend a copy, what will she have? She will have an unauthorized copy of a proprietary program. And that's a rather nasty thing. Almost as nasty as an authorized copy of the same program. <laughs> it's not nasty because of being unauthorized, it's nasty because it's proprietary. So when you have fully understood this issue, what should you really do? You should make sure you don't fall into the dilemma. I know two ways. One is don't have any friends. <laughs> That's what the proprietary developers have in mind for you. Instead of friends, you can have Facebook friends. The other solution, the, the other method, my method is don't use that program. If you don't have a copy, then you have a very simple answer. I can't give you a copy because I don't have one. So if someone offers me a program, no matter how attractive it might be, under the conditions that I not share it with you, I tell him, my conscience does not permit me to accept the conditions you have imposed Therefore, I won't accept, I won't use this program, take it out of here and get out of my office. That's what you should tell him too. Shame on you for asking me to promise to betray others to get this program. And we should also reject the propaganda terms that they use to demonize cooperation and sharing. Terms like pirate. <clears throat> when they call people who share pirates, what are they really saying? They're saying that helping other people is the moral equivalent of attacking ships. <laughs> but ethically speaking, that's as wrong as you can get because attacking ships is very bad, but sharing is good. So let's not call them by the same name. The reason they want to do that is they want to make sharing sound bad. And we shouldn't let them get away with that. So refuse to call sharing piracy. When people ask me what I think of piracy, I say attacking ships is very bad. <laughs> But fortunately, there haven't been many pirates around here for a thousand years or so. <clears throat> and if they ask me what I think of uh, movie piracy, I say, well, I like the first Pirates of the Caribbean. <laughs> so you get the point. I look for a visible and funny way to reject their propaganda media. Because if you repeat the enemy's propaganda terminology, you're spreading the enemy's propaganda. So that's the reason for freedom too, the freedom to help others, to redistribute exact copies when you wish. It's essential on fundamental moral grounds. But freedom zero, the freedom to run the program as you wish for whatever purpose, is essential for a different reason, so you can control your own computing. All users deserve to have control of their own computing. And if you don't have control of your own computing, then whoever does have control is likely to wipe the floor with you using that control. So, there are proprietary programs that 
restrict through their licenses even the use of the authorized copies. For instance, there's a proprietary program for managing websites whose license forbids using it to publish anything that criticizes the program's developer. In this case, proprietary software literally denies the users freedom of speech. Obviously, if you can't even freely use the copy that's there for your use, you don't control your computing. So freedom zero is essential. But it's not enough, because that's the freedom to either do or not do whatever things the code of the program is set up to permit. Which means the developer still imposes his power on you, not through the license if you have freedom zero, but instead through the code itself. So in order to have control of your computing, you need freedom one, the freedom to study the source code and change it so the program does your computing as you wish. But that way, you decide what it will do, instead of letting him impose his decisions on you. Now, freedom one includes the having the real option of putting your program in place of the one that it that you got. There are products today which have, there are computers which are tyrants. They allow someone else to change the software, but they don't allow the, they don't allow you to change the software, even if you bought the computer. That is an injustice. They include many Android devices. And sad to say, many medical devices, such as uh, heart stimulators, uh, which basically I would have to refuse to use. It's clear to me I'd have to refuse to have such a thing put into me that has software others can change and I can't. So, <clears throat> freedom one includes not just the freedom to study and change the source code as a theoretical exercise. You've got to be able to actually use your version in place of the version someone else supplied to you in order to have real control over your computing that you do with that program. So, if you don't have freedom one, you can't tell what that program actually does. And these programs quite often have malicious features designed to spy on the user, restrict the user, or even attack the user. And you might think, well, once in a while this might happen, but why worry about it so much? Life has many rare dangers that happen to somebody from time to time, but it's unlikely they will happen to you today. This is not one of those rare dangers. This is the usual case. Almost all users of proprietary software are using proprietary malware software designed to mistreat them. Let me prove this with a list of examples. One proprietary package in which people have found all three of these kinds of malicious features that you may have heard of is called Microsoft Windows. People have found spy features that send information about the use of the machine. Of course, you can see the digital handcuffs, the restriction features, also known as digital restrictions management, DRM, or technical restriction measures. <clears throat> the back door 
servers designed to receive commands and do things to the user that, without asking permission, of course, they are not so easy to see. But we know of two backdoors in Windows. So Windows is malware. Software designs so that it can be used to hurt the user is malware. But it's even worse than that, because one of these back doors gives Microsoft the power to remotely impose changes, any changes. Microsoft could, could remotely change anything at all once it has Windows running in the machine, which means that any malicious feature not in Windows today could be remotely installed tomorrow. Windows is universal malware. But it's not alone. The Macintosh system is also malware. It has digital handcuffs. But the I thing the monstrous newer products of Apple are much worse. They've the spy features have been found in them, and they have the tightest handcuffs. They pioneered the tightest digital handcuffs ever in general purpose computers because they uh, Apple seized control even over the installation of applications. Users are not allowed to install whatever programs they wish. They can only install programs from the Apple Store. In other words, Apple practices censorship of software for those users. <laughs> and when the users found ways to break those particular digital handcuffs, they referred to it as jailbreaking, which effectively recognizes that those products are designed as prisons for their users. And there's also a known backdoor. So the software at Apple computer products is malware. <clears throat> then there's Flash Player, which is malware. It has a surveillance feature and digital handcuffs. Flash Player is gratis, but it's not free. And this example shows it, it's a mistake to be distracted by questions of price. They don't matter. What matters is whether the software is free, and this isn't. The only significance of the fact that Flash Player is gratis is that Adobe does not make the users pay to be abused. Then there's the Amazon Swindle. Not its official name. It's an ebook reader product, which I call the Swindle because that's its effect. It swindles users out of the traditional freedoms of book readers. For instance, there is <clears throat> there's the a freedom to acquire a book anonymously, paying cash which is the only way I buy books. I won't let a database have any information about what books I have. But that's impossible with the swindle because Amazon won't let people pay cash. Amazon requires users to identify themselves even, if, even when they don't have to pay, which means that Amazon manages a giant list of all the books each user has read, a list whose very existence threatens human rights no matter where it, it is kept. Then there's the freedom to give the book to someone else after you read it, or lend it to various friends, or sell it to a used bookstore. Freedoms that Amazon takes away with digital handcuffs, and also, with end-user license agreements, which say that the user doesn't really own the book, but only has a license to read it under Amazon's imposed conditions. 
And then, so this is Amazon's idea of private property. Everything belongs to us, is what Amazon says. That's not private property. That's a parody of private property. Then there's the freedom to keep the book as long as you wish. A freedom that Amazon eliminates with a back door in the swindle. We know about this back door by observation. We can't study the source code, so we don't know all the things that they can do with it. But we've seen them do one thing, remotely erase books. In 2009, <clears throat> Amazon remotely erased thousands of copies of a particular book. Copies which, until that day, were authorized. People had obtained them directly from Amazon in the usual approved manner. And then Amazon decided one day that they had to be deleted, and it just did so. I met somebody who said that the book disappeared as he was reading it. This was an Orwellian act. And what was the book? 1984 by George Orwell. <laughs> a book that presents a totalitarian state whose crimes started with destroying all the books it didn't like and got worse from there. <clears throat> there was a lot of criticism of Amazon after that, so Amazon promised it would never do this again unless ordered to by the state. For those who have read 1984, this is not very comforting. <laughs> you should all read that book, but obviously not on the swindle. The official name of that product is Kindle. Kindle means to start a fire, perhaps meant to suggest that its purpose is virtual book burning. Then, for my final example, how about nearly all portable phones? Because they contain proprietary software, and even if the user isn't allowed to change anything, somebody else can. In fact, they have surveillance features, and they have a universal back door. The surveillance feature is it sends geolocation information, and the user can't stop it. But the universal back door <coughs> means they can change the software remotely. Some, I, I say they, it's typically some company or other that has this power. Often it's the phone network company that has this power. If not, then it's some other company. And they have used this power to convert phones into listening devices. I mean, devices that transmit all the conversation they hear all the time. And you don't have to talk right into the microphone. It can listen to you in your pocket or at the other side of the room. You've heard of software that has bugs. This software is a bug. Portable phones are Stalin's dream. And that's my reason for not having them. So, this list is enough because almost everyone in the world that uses proprietary software is using something on this list. So, almost every user of proprietary software is the victim of proprietary malware. But these are just a few examples. You know, there are thousands of other proprietary programs, and in most cases, we have no way of knowing if they're malware. Why can't we know? Because we don't have the source code. We can't check. The developer, who is the same one who might or might not have put in malware, is also stopping us from checking whether it's malware. So those programs are essentially just trust me software. They demand blind faith in an organization which is typically a corporation. Corporations are not known for their ethical 
old standards of treatment of the general public. And by their structure, they are psychopaths. So, obviously, you shouldn't ever trust any of those programs. Now, there's some of them, I'm sure, that have no malicious features. The problem is we can't tell which ones they are. <clears throat> but what about those? The, the, the non-free programs that, without Freedom One that surely do exist where the developers have not tried to put in any malicious features. What can we say about them? Well, those developers may not have tried to mistreat their users with, with malware, but they're humans and they make mistakes. The code of those programs has errors. And the user of a program without Freedom 1 is just as helpless facing an accidental error as facing an intentional malicious feature. If you use a program without Freedom 1, you're a prisoner of the code. We free software developers are human too, so we also make mistakes. Our code has errors too, because every non-trivial program has errors. You can't avoid it. But if you find an error in our free code, or anything in the code you don't like, you are free to change it because we did not make you a prisoner. We can't be perfect. We can respect your freedom. So freedom one is essential. But it's not enough, because that's the freedom to personally study and change the source code, or to do it within one organization. That's not enough, because most users don't know how to program. Most users don't know how to exercise freedom one directly. <clears throat> In effect, freedom one gives, freedom zero and one give each user control individually over his or its computing. And individual control is not enough. We need collective control also. We need to be able to work together to exercise control over some version of the program. So we also need freedom three. The freedom to contribute to your community. The freedom to distribute copies of your modified versions to others when you wish. With this freedom, if several users want to, they can collaborate in making a modified version of the program because this freedom allows each one to send the changes to the others. And then, when they, if they wish, when they have a version they're happy with, they can offer copies to the public, too. And that way, any group of users can also exercise control over the program together. <clears throat> 